Welcome to another segment of the ongoing Kundalini Awakening series. I'm your host, Brent Spirit, and my guest today is Brittany Marie. Brittany, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for giving me this experience to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm really excited for where our conversation goes. So, of course, I have to share with my audience how we became connected. The, the YouTube algorithm blessed me with a thumbnail for one of your videos about your Kundalini awakening journey. And every now and then I see videos like this, people sharing their journey, and some of them I really enjoy. And yours was absolutely amazing, excellent, really well put together. And, and you had the you know really high quality B-roll images going along with your story. And not only that, but your story is so fascinating and you explained a lot of the challenges you faced and interspersed throughout that was great gems of wisdom for how others can get through similar challenges. And so, of course, that is the aim of, of my work here is to have people on like yourself that have gone through or are going through Kundalini awakening, spiritual awakening, to share about some of the challenges they faced, the solutions they found with others that are going through similar difficulty. And so immediately I thought, you know, I have to get Brittany on the show. So thank you. Thank you for you know putting out those two main talks on your channel about your journey, along with your other talks about uh, various topics to do with uh, the journey, healing, working in, in human services. We've got some really interesting stuff on your channel. So today I'm really excited to dive into some of the more nuanced things that you experienced on your journey, some of those those darker periods, as well as some of the exciting things. But of course, I invite our audience to listen to Brittany's two-part telling of her story on her channel. The links will be in the description to her channel. Really, really worthwhile. You give an excellent overview of what Kundalini is as well with some great animations and it's really well put together. So, so thank you. Thank you. So Brittany shared with me that she's been going through spiritual awakening for about eight years. Six of those years being Kundalini awakening process a rather intense process, but it seems that you've come to a point now based on you know the, the telling of your story that you shared, where you're ready to share and offer service and you're feeling like you know, you've know you come through some of the most difficult parts of this process, working towards deeper and deeper integration. And so I, I, I pl it's a pleasure to have you as an example for where this process might be taking us. Uh, Brittany, share with me that she's a psychotherapist by profession. She was doing that work for the past 10 years. But now, of course, the the flow or her journey is taking her in a new direction, working in a more general way as a spiritual guide, a spiritual teacher, spiritual healer. And Brittany's coming to us today from Nebraska. So let's jump right in. Of course, like I mentioned, you know, I know you went really deep into your whole biography in, in a chronological manner, in those other talks. Well, let's jump right into some of the more intense and, and exciting parts of your journey where this sort of kundalini awakening energetic process began happening to you. What sort of triggered it? What were the first signs? What were some of those those interesting things that you know you started to experience? Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for letting me be here. And I'm really excited to have this conversation. It's the first one like this that I've had. But just a little bit before we get to the kundalini experience, I had a spiritual awakening about two, two and a half years before that. And so in that process, I was really getting exposed to a lot of spiritual information from the clients that I had um, been working with. And so we're talking about the spirit world and spirit attachments. So it started helping me move away from just understanding things from a psychological lens and more of the mental health focus to understanding people's experiences with their own spiritual healing work, whether it's challenges around courtings or feelings um, that they have curses or spirit attachments. So that really started to introduce me into the spiritual dynamic. And so I worked with Native American clients as well as Muslim clients and Yazidi refugees. And I also worked in serving different clients from Mexico. So they started to bring in all these different kinds of conversations about how their spiritual health was really impacting their mental health. And so I got to a point where I was like, okay, I feel like I need to start considering this. So I started to do some more research on this and started realizing Elmer Green, Edith Bjor, Dr. Baldwin, he's a psychiatrist, started to write books about this dynamic of what happens when someone goes into hypnosis. Sometimes they're communicating 
you know, with spirits and things. And so that really got me more connected with the spiritual piece. I had this big spiritual awakening, but it was mostly impacting like a psychological improvement and just figuring out like, who am I? What is this life thing? So then that led up to me having more of this openness um, to include my spiritual health. So then I received a article in a blog and I don't even really remember subscribing to this blog, but it was by Lisa Rankin. And it, the title was something to the effect of what doctors and psychologists need to know about kundalini emergence and spiritual emergency. And so I read this because before then I started having all of these dreams where I was seeing snakes and in my real life, I was seeing so many snakes. We're talking like probably a hundred of snakes. And I was like, this is so weird. I live in the Midwest, but I have never come across this number of snakes before dead or alive. It was just a very peculiar type of experience. But the first thing that I saw um, on this blog was this ancient depiction of a snake and the kundalini energy rising upward. So I read this article and I was like, wow, my mind was really blown open to this whole other facet of spirituality that I didn't know existed or hadn't had any reference in my Catholic upbringing or in my Lakota um, culture. So I read all about this and I was so fascinated and I was like, whatever this is, I want this. I am so excited for this. So I started to watch videos on how do you get this kundalini awakening to arise? But then I saw the videos of the kundalini emergency that it led to people having severe symptoms from it to the point that they were contemplating suicide or they did attempt suicide or they did take their own life or they were just so physically uncomfortable because of the vibration or an itchiness or burningness in their body. So after that, it kind of scared me a bit from Kundalini. And I was like, there is no way that I want to purposefully like bring this up and initiate this. But then I was still so fascinated about reading about it. So I found a book called Betsy Rabior and I started to just learn about Kundalini and I read her whole book within maybe like a week or two. And she really details this whole physiological and spiritual experience for herself and how it unfolds and the different stages that it progresses through. So in that meantime, I began to be more inclined to read spiritual books and understanding this phenomena, but I wasn't doing anything to actively pursue it. And I was a bit afraid to do that. And I just said, you know, if this is supposed to be something I'm going to do, I surrender my will for the will of the great mystery or the great spirit. And so I was like, I'll just let everything be as it is. And then I started having these really lucid dreams and I was being coached and guided and receiving spiritual information. And each time I was put into these very fear-based scenarios where it was like, okay, I'm with apex predators. My life is being threatened. I'm really scared. I can feel all of this fear, but I don't know what to do with it. And then I would receive this guidance of just saying, surrender, let go, breathe, ask for help. And so I feel like this was all an initiation. It was like a preparation for that initiation of Kundalini. So I started going through this, documenting all of my dreams. And then after that, I began to have incredible amounts of heat coming through my body. And I was asking people at the clinic that I worked at, I was like, can we turn the air conditioner down? My office must be so muggy and hot, but it wasn't just happening in my office where I thought it was just poor circulation. So I was getting all this amazing amounts of heat and it wasn't <clears throat> great. And I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm in pre-menopause. I must be having hot flashes. I don't know what's going on here. And then I had moments too, where I would have like my muscles would pulse and vibrate. And it was almost like my, I could watch my muscles spasming. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but I just assumed it was a blockage of energy. But even that language yet still wasn't something that I was completely familiar with. I had only had a light introduction into understanding the meridians, acupuncture, and the chakra systems, but I just kind of watched these like blockages or these weird pulses of energy. And then after that, I, some of the more energetic things that were happening is there would be buzzing and vibration in my body, but I don't know if I was not fully aware of it and disconnected where I thought it was my husband and I thought he had restless leg syndrome. And it's still weird that I didn't have that connection with my body yet to understand that this was actually coming from within. And it wasn't until one night he was not in the room with me and I had called out and said, Hey, you know, can you please move over? Like you're shaking the whole bed. I even was like, we need to get separate beds. I don't know what is happening. I cannot sleep very well because of this vibration that I'm feeling throughout the bed. 
Well, then he responded from the living room. And that's when I was like, wow, my body is responding. And there might've been elements of my own trauma work that I needed to do that I dissociated from my body and was still learning how to come into it and that it was a safe place to be in. But after that, I was more body self-aware and I was like watching the currents of this energy and this vibration happening. And then a little while later, I was doing a lot of work around like spirits and spirit attachments, just because that was really the culture that I was in working with clients. And so I woke up one night and I was in a paralysis and I couldn't move and my eyes were open and I was very self-aware of like what was happening, but it was like my body was still in a sleep state. And I looked out and I saw this really dark forming energy and it was moving around and shifting shapes. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, there is a spirit here. This does not feel like a positive spirit. I don't know what to do. I can't speak. I can't move. I wanted to get closer to my husband, but I really felt stuck to be able to do anything. Well, this energy moves and it's right over my shoulder and it's speaking like telepathically. And it's communicating to me in a sense of almost like become ignorant again, like go back to sleep, become less self-aware. Don't do all of this self-examination, self-study and healing work that you're trying to do and trying to help people, you know, move into to reaching their highest potential, whether that's through healing or education or teaching them about meditation in their energy field. And in that moment, I was like, this really feels like the devil is here with me. And I don't know if it was an actual entity or if it was a part of my own unconscious and my own sense of ignorance of saying like, is it, is all the pain worth it that I've been going through? Because the spiritual awakening was beautiful, but it was very, very painful. And so then what had happened is I heard this inner knowing that just said, Brittany, you can pray, you can ask for help and you can surrender, pray for God to help you and ask for your spirit guides to be in the space with you. And the minute that I did that, it was like my body just released. And I had this surge of energy shooting up from my, like the base of my spine. But it was so interesting because as I was, it was coming up, I was seeing it visually though. And so when it was coming up, it was like this ball of fire energy and it was moving up the spine. And then it was coming into my awareness. And by this time I had closed my eyes and I was seeing this explosion of light. So I was like, wait, I'm going to open my eyes now and see if this is still happening. And I opened my eyes and it was still like my focus was turned inward, perhaps to my third eye. And I saw this explosion of light and this different, it was kind of changing colors and changing forms. And then after that, my whole body was flushed with heat. And I don't, I, I've heard about this sometimes, but I don't necessarily know like the proper terminology, but it was like, there was this thick liquid that was like coming from my like throat area or my like salvation glands. And it was just filling my mouth with this really warm, like sweet honey, but there was nothing actually in my mouth. And then it felt like there was drops of kind of molasses running throughout my body. It was like slower, heavier dew drops of energy. And then after that, there was so much heat and intensity, but then there was like a sense from my brain, there were still all these lights happening, but there was like cold chunks of water that felt like were spouting out from my brain throughout my whole body. And it was cooling down my system. So that would have been my first introduction to kind of the more intense energetic experiences that led into the Kundalini experience. When it had happened, even though I had read about it, I still had no association that this is what was going on. And so I was a little bit nervous and confused about like, am I having a stroke? Am I having like a mental health crisis? What is happening here? But thankfully I was able to reach out to a spiritual teacher and they were able to give me some insight on what it was that was happening and making sense of that energy and all of the heat and the heat lasted for quite some time. So Wow. That's a lot to go through in uh, just a few years in a, in a short period of time. Very interesting that your, <clears throat> excuse me, that your clients were the ones to, you know, begin to bring your attention to, to spirituality. Uh, you know, there's this saying, you know, when the, the student is ready, the teacher appears and uh, it's, I guess they can come in all different forms. Sometimes they can come even as people that maybe, you know, in some context, you could stay where your students, uh, you yeah. being the therapist, them being the clients. Fascinating, fascinating. 
Yeah, there, it's very common for many people to have these encounters with with snakes in particular in dreams and visions. Synchronicity will bring snakes to you in nature. But yeah, you mentioned you know seeing so many. I had a couple of experiences myself as well being in nature. I would just you know, one time I had my feet, you know, just dipping my toes in, in this lake and this big water snake came right up to me. Oh. Different things like that. Very interesting encounters with snakes. So, so much there in your experience to, to explore. You mentioned the liquid, that, that sweet kind of honey liquid. Just yeah. before I forget, I believe it's called Amrita. Okay. Like with the yogis would call it amrita. It's like in set from Sanskrit. They say it's like, you know, it's like the nectar, the nectar of, of the gods, the nectar of gods, something like that. For those yeah. out there who may be experiencing a similar thing and wondering about that, it's it's a known, it's a known experience. But so much there to to explore. So you have this this prep preparatory period, and, and I like the words you use, you know, you're like, you know, some sort of initiation towards the actual kundalini awakening, which seems that you've just gone through but interestingly though you were made aware through synchronicity through the flow about the topic of kundalini with those you know strange emails coming to you that maybe you didn't subscribe to the spam emails god's spamming you you could say it's it's interesting like the the word kundalini seems to come to people in very strange ways and i've met many people and i'm one of them who knew about the process who knew about kundalini and yet when it happens for some reason, not able to connect the dots. Very, yeah. very interesting how this unfolds. There's a, a great uh, doctor, Dr. Yvonne Kason. She had a very similar experience to you. Began corresponding with Gopi Krishna, who's like one of the most celebrated Kundalini writers. Began mm -hmm. corresponding with him about Kundalini and about his work. And for whatever reason, she still wasn't able to connect the dots that she had her own Kundalini awakening. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it took her years to, to put the dots together. It, it's very interesting how this unfolds. So you have this interesting experience, to put it mildly, very interesting experience. Um, what what starts happening now after this, this rising takes place? Absolutely. So I was nervous and I was, because I was so grounded in a psychological sense and in the field of mental health, I was thinking like, maybe I need a physical, I need to go to an optometrist to check my eyes out because I was nervous that I think throughout this whole process, I really struggled with like believing that this was really happening, even though there was so much um, information and like understandings and things that were coming out that it's like, I can't deny this. But my mind was so logic based that I was like, I have to have proof. I have to know that this is real. And because I didn't have people in my world to validate that or to guide me through that, I really doubted and would get lost in confusion and overwhelm. So it's like, okay, before I jump to any conclusions, like I just need to make sure I'm okay physically. So I went to an eye specialist. I was like, I just want to make sure I don't have a stroke in my eyes. Because one of the other things that started happening is I started to see energy. And I started to see people's auras and I would go outside and look at trees and I would see these massive energetic fields and auras around them. Another thing that I started to see were would be images of behind people's shoulders. And at the time, I didn't know what those were. And so it wasn't until years later, like maybe four years, four or five years later that I was in yoga teacher training and they were showing us the Dharma wheel. And then I was like, oh my goodness, that's because I would try to draw these images out. Not very well, not the greatest drawer, but I would try to show these images to people to say, do you know what this means? Or does this have any, you know, meaning to you? And most people were like, I have absolutely no idea what that is. It has no significance to my culture or my background. So then it, I realized it was like the Dharma wheel. And I still don't fully understand why I was seeing the Dharma wheel kind of over people's shoulders, but it was really interesting too. And it people who are more adept spiritually or maybe had mediumship or psychic abilities themselves or clients who had like schizophrenia or maybe severe bipolar, their auras were just electric. I mean, I would just see all these swirls of energy and it would sometimes move up my wall, um, the wall that they were sitting in, in my office. And I would just watch all of this. And I was just like, I don't know kind of 
if this is normal or if this is something going on with my eyes. And then I would have these moments where I would look out and like everything would become pixelated and everything was like vibrating very fastly. And then my eyes would point out to something and it would lock onto it. And it was almost like a camera lens was like zooming into it. And then I would zoom into it and my eyes would just start ticking back and forth, right and left. Well, I had some familiarity with that because of EMDR. So eye movement desensitization reprocessing, we use bilateral movements with the eyes to help the two hemispheres of the brain communicate to hopefully process imbalances or any type of issues that are within the limbic system, which we are associating with like the amygdala and trauma. And so I was just in those places where I would just allow that to happen, but I would really have no trauma history or context of like what I would be processing, but I would just have these moments where my gaze would just lock in on this point and would just, I would see this ticking movement so then I started having increased some increased psychic experiences too, where I had increased empathy, where I would go in and I was like, gosh, I'm having like weird chest pain right now, or I would have shooting pain down my neck or my ankle would start hurting. And I just started feeling like, why am I having all these physical symptoms? So one time the pain was very intense and I, I had called out to my client. I said, I am so sorry. Like my knee just started hurting out of nowhere and it's on fire and this is very uncomfortable. I actually need to take a moment, you know, to catch my breath in this. And they looked up to me and they said, are you serious? My knee is doing that. Like my knee is in so much pain and I'm waiting to get my shot, my um, cortisol shot. So I was like, that is very weird. And then when they left, the pain went away. And then the next person came in and I started finally just being like trusting myself and just saying, this might not be anything related to what you have going on, but I'm having a lot of tension in my hips or I'm having a, you know, a really strong pain in my thighs. And so an athlete I was working with was like, yeah, I have a lot of overuse injuries in my legs. And so my muscles are so bound and they're so tight and, and so much pain. And so I started to realize that a lot of the things that I was experiencing weren't all my own energetic blockages, but I was beginning to like actually be able to sense physical experiences within another person's body or perhaps like energetic emotional blockages. So when a person would get sad, all of a sudden I would have the heat rise up in my heart or my throat would start to feel bound. And so once I started to relate to that, the minute I spoke on it and I would share with clients like, Hey, you know, I'm starting to feel this in my body. What are you feeling? And they would say, yes, most often it was like exactly what they were experiencing, but for whatever reason, it would help it to like energetically decompress for them and for me, it was like this experience was just being validated. And then we would bring awareness if they were open to it of like, can we just sit with this discomfort for a minute? And later on in my career, as I was doing energy work, we would then use muscle testing and setting intentions and use the body code or the emotion code system to actually go into the body, into the energy body and say, what is here? Why is the body, you know, reflecting this pain in the jaw right now? Or why am I getting like twitches in my eye and this eye discomfort? And so that was something that had ha started to happen. And then I would start to go into moments where I would, I would go into meditation and I would start to see people like clear as a day, these images of people. And I really didn't know who it was or like who these people were, but it wasn't frightening and it wasn't anything like intrusive, but I would just kind of say like, I don't know if these are people in spirit or what's happening here. And then there was one day I was in session and I had this really powerful feeling that this person's loved one was here. And then it came to the point where they were saying, you've got it, like telepathically, a notion says I'm here. And I would like to have a message shared with the person that you're working with. And I was thinking, no way, you know, like I'm a therapist, I'm doing clinical work. This is not a spiritual counseling type practice. Like I'm not doing that. So all of a sudden the light bulb started to etch and it started making this weird etching sound. So I was like, okay, you know, and, and it was like, I just said, if that is, if this is the spirit of this person, this loved one of the, the spirit of this loved one of the person I'm working with, like, please just honor my boundaries. I'm not sharing this information. Let's just move forward. So then it started doing it again. And I said, no, and the light bulb burst out and it popped and we both got, kind of got startled. Now this person doesn't have any idea that their mother had come into the room. And so I went in and I said, again, I said, you know, please like, I just do not want to share this information. I really am going to ask that you take this back. And I am not in a place, I'm not a medium for that. And I don't 
I wasn't looking for that, you know? So then all of a sudden my books slam over on my bookshelf. And so I finally said, and at that point I was a little bit startled. So I said, Hey, I know. And I really think we have to be careful with this because sometimes people don't want this and we don't want it to be intrusive prophecies or intrusive messages that aren't ready. But I said, Hey, I think someone is here. They have a message. I've been telling them, no, I know this sounds so crazy. What do you want to do with this information? And so they had said, um, at first, no, they did not want to receive the message. So I just said, okay, both of us have said, no, let's move on. A couple of weeks later, they come back into my office and we are in the same situation and the books slam over again, that light bulb starts etching. And I was like, okay, my light bulb's probably going to burst out. And I just said, hey, this person is here again. And I don't know what you want me to do with the information. What are you comfortable with? And they finally said, I think it's okay. I feel safe and comfortable for this. And so I had just shared this message about something that had happened within their family dynamics and kind of an old issue that they, the mom wanted them to resolve within the siblings of the family. And then the mom had just wanted to say like, I forgive you. Like there is no, like, I was never even in a position that needed to forgive you. It was you that always needed to forgive yourself for kind of the end experiences at the end of my life. And the person was just, it was very emotional. We were both in tears and it was just, we could feel the energy of it and we could feel the love of it. And the messages to me had no significance because I'm like, I don't know if this is based in truth or anything. I'm just saying, here's the information. And then the person was able to give me more history. The person was able to give me then history about like what this was and this whole dynamic that had played out. And afterwards they had shared, like, I just have so much more peace, you know, within myself and in relation to all of this. So I started to have some more of those kind of stranger kind of psychic phenomena started to happen where I would see like orbs or I would see these like really pretty crystal like balls. They were kind of like what the color looks like on the back of a CD and they would kind of come in or they would pop in or they would like float around the office. Um, And then I started having like visions was where I was able to sometimes see people in spirit or channel and communicate or channel and communicate with dogs. It was very hard because it was so, and I don't know if I had my empathic abilities like under control where I was kind of this, this open heart where it was very painful. So anytime that happened, like I kind of assumed that when people were in spirit, they were kind of washed away and released from all this pain. But in that experience of surrogation and channeling, that wasn't the case. And I would feel their pain and the grief or the sadness that they had. And even animals, it was like, it would be so intense. So it really took a lot out of me. And it wasn't something that I made a common practice to do. And it was only something I really did with like my family and people that I was very close with, but it was draining and exhausting. And so later on, I had eventually learned how to have much better boundaries with that. So I wasn't suffering so intensely and feeling, but I read in another book by Elizabeth Hatch in her book initiation. And she talks about that. She's like, when you're suspending your energy and you're in a sense, channeling someone else, like you're bringing in a whole new field of energy within your nervous system that your nerves are not adapted to. And so it does um, create a certain level of exhaustion and a certain level of demand on our nerves because we're not really wired for their um, energy output. But I thankfully have been able to do those things in a safer way for myself where it isn't so demanding and taxing. But before all that happened, I made sure my mental health was okay. And by getting some evaluation and things like that done. And then I also went to the medical providers to make sure there were no underlying health conditions that were causing me to have like a stroke in my eyes or anything. Because I was seeing all these colors and I was like, what is this? I don't know if it's normal, but thankfully I reached out to this author of this book, Our Light Body, and she was so amazing. And she really guided me throughout this process and said, you know, these are some of the things that can happen. This is how it will cause, you know, changes in the nervous system and within our optic nerves as this energy is rising, integrating, and, you know, eventually becoming our new normal. Fascinating. Fascinating. So it seems like you had a a, a lot of I guess psychic abilities or paranormal or supernatural phenomena begin mm-hmm. to happen to you. Of course, 
you know, you, you, you've been a psychotherapist for, for 10 years. So it seems that this is your archetype, so the archetype of the healer. But then that those experiences can be pretty challenging because they don't fit within the typical psychotherapy model. You know, no. as you were sharing about these, you know, these experiences of empathy, feeling pain with from your clients, I was thinking, you know, what would, you know, what would Carl Rogers say about this degree of empathy, right? The Rogerian model of, of psychotherapy is, you know, it's very much about empathy and validation, but I just, I'm, I'm curious, you know, if he could, it would be interesting to hear his comment on what about a therapist who quite literally takes on the physical pain of the client in order to empathize and validate and to help them to process it. That's a whole different level, which of course must require the the spiritual domain. So you mentioned now going through some initiations around this this heightened degree of empathy, you know, sensitivity. Clearly they're they're gifts that you have to be effective at healing, like you know how you mentioned with the client who you were able to channel a message for them and there's great healing. A lot of people on this path who don't necessarily know that they're, you know, a healer. Um, they begin to have very similar sensitivities and they want to turn it off. They want it to go away. They may not be able to connect the dots and recognize that this isn't their stuff. You mentioned that you learned with boundaries and some other ways to, to manage these sensitivities. Can you share some, some tips, some insights for those out there that are really getting bombarded with energies from other people? You know, when they go out to the store, they can't go out in crowds. They can't even talk to their friends anymore because they're just taking on a lot of stuff. What can you share for them? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've been a highly sensitive person from the beginning. Even as a child, I would come home and I'd watch things on Oprah. I'd watch the news with my grandparents and or I would hear things, you know, at school and see people being mistreated. And even from a young age, like I felt so sad for people. And I was like, this isn't, this isn't how we're supposed to live. Like we're supposed to be kind with one another. We're supposed to treat one another well. And I would just cry to my grandma and be like, this, you know, I feel so sad. And she's like, who hurt you? You know, my grandma is a little feisty. And she's like, who hurt you? You know, we need to go and set some boundaries and, you know, tell it whoever it is that's bothering you to step back. And I was like, oh, it's not that, you know, it's this person that was mistreated that I saw. And she was just like, oh, Brittany, she's like, you cannot, this is too much. Like you can't be suffering and having so much pain for everyone else's experiences. But as a child, that doesn't really make sense. And I don't know how to, what to do with that. And so as an adult, it started coming back to me, like this highly sensitive quality was really always there whether it comes from, you know, trauma and becoming really attuned to my environment or perhaps being, you know, something I brought in from a past life or that it's just a natural skill or ability from, for whatever it is within this incarnation. I started to realize though, that I was becoming very exhausted and I was experiencing burnout in my work. And I was thinking, this is so difficult to feel all of this emotion. Plus I also had high expectations of myself to be you know, effective at the healing work that I did. So I had this demand of like, I need to try to give my all to try to help alleviate the suffering and sorrow. But then I also am now experiencing this on such a deep, intense level with the person that I'm with, that I started to share this with another healer that I was working with. And she was like, you know, you have to figure out how to understand the difference between compassion and empathy. She's like, your homework for this week is to go and read up on this and understand that there is a difference. So I started to understand that I don't need to feel all of this in my body. And I didn't realize at the time that I have the rights to set internal boundaries with these gifts, with these energies that are coming up. For some people, it might sound really cool to be able to channel and to maybe see orbs and spirits. But when you are in a science-based field, that is going to get you, that is not going to help you because it is based on, you know, what we can see, the tangible based on evidence-based theories and approaches, you know, to healing. And so I did always feel like that conflicts there of this isn't, it's cool, I guess, in some ways, but this is also like conflicts against the world that I'm in, you know, in the medical field. And so I was working in at an urban Indian medical center. And so we were serving, you know, this culture that was very spiritually based. And so it was that really was helpful to do that. Otherwise, I think if I was on like a just regular community mental health center or private practice, 
where that kind of wasn't the foundation yet, I think it would have been, it would just would have been very weird to help to figure out how to integrate all of that. But I started to understand, I know I'm kind of moving all around talking about these little things that have happened, but so these gifts weren't seen at first as gifts. And then I started to learn how to accept them, how to work safely within them and how to make sure that we're not channeling energies that are not what they really are supposed to be. Like, you know, we can tap into areas that we are, we don't really understand and that don't have the same positive intent that we may have. So with all of that, I started to realize I can set these internal boundaries. I can set up boundaries to say, you know, I want to work within the love of Jesus or Archangel Michael or within the love of our creator and kind of call on these, you know, spiritual avatars or Krishna or Kwan Lin. And so as I started to do that, I started to realize I have more power in this. I'm not kind of helpless to these circumstances or these abilities that are starting to surface. And in that, I started to understand within myself, I do not need to feel this with them. I'm a space in a presence of unconditional regard, compassion, love, and support, but I do not need to take on the energy. So I started to do things like visualizations where I would see roots from it coming from my feet, like grounding into the ground, keeping me sturdy, or I would maybe practice like a seed mantra of the root and just kind of repeat that uh, mantra over and in my mind to keep me grounded. Other times I would use Donna Eden's technique. So she has this technique um, called the zip up and you guys can find this on YouTube if you have any interest to look at that. But she teaches about how to zip up the conception meridian that runs up the front of our body and how when we zip this up with this technique, it kind of conceals and zips up the, the front of the chakras. So we're not bringing in and absorbing so much energy. So I started to build in these kind of practices each day that I would get into my office. I would bring a chime in or like a singing bowl. And I would just say, you know, I want to energetically clear and cleanse this space. I would envision white lights to clear out any kind of old emotional energies or spiritual energies that were in that space. And then I would set boundaries with myself. I would just say, you know, I'm placing a golden shield of light around me. I zip up the front line of my chakras. I only allow loving energy to come in. And I do not allow, allow the um, negative energy to go out for my clients to take on from me, but I also don't take in their energy too. And so I started to create these like rituals of clearing my fields in, in between each session. And sometimes I would get ported with clients. So they would come in and very quickly within a couple of minutes, I would feel so tired and I would be so ran down and I was almost would feel sick. Like I was like, I don't know if I can finish the session. And they would have this huge boost of energy and they're like, oh, I feel so good. The minute I get in here, it just feels really light and airy. And I just, I feel better. My pain goes away and I feel more at peace and I can think clear. And I'm thinking, I feel so awful. Like I'm having so much fatigue and pain in my body and mental fog. And I didn't know exactly what that was at first, but then people would start saying like, I come in here to get my dose of energy. Like I get you know, being in your field in the space with you. And at first I didn't know that it was actually my energy that they were maybe pulling on because my field was so open and I was so giving in that sense where I didn't have healthy boundaries of saying, I need to conserve and consume energy for me to keep myself safe versus being such an open field, wanting to really serve the needs of others. And so, and I didn't, I don't know necessarily even if it was my field that they were, it was, wasn't just like I had this positive aura that they were getting I think too, when two people come together and it creates a positive intention to focus on self-development and healing, it creates its own energy field that um, we can both draw on and kind of recharge from. But then I started realizing we were creating these energetic cordings. And so when they would leave, I would test like, you know, they corded and I would figure out which chakra, which part of my body or my aura are they cording to? And then I'd work on like energetically and mentally saying, you know, like I release this cord, I set these boundaries. You can be with me, I can be with you, but it's not safe for us to kind of consume each other's energy. And then I would muscle test too, is this me giving out too much energy or is this their energy feeling so depleted that it's almost like they're pulling and they're taking my energy. Because some people's auras are so loving and so giving and other people's auras, it's almost like a vortex and they're so, they're just lonely or they're going through so much. And so when you're with them, you can just feel that they are in need. And so once I started understanding this play of energy and these energetic boundaries, that really helped me.
And I eventually want to get and put all this down and create a video on this so other people can learn about this, especially for people who are sensitive and want to be able to go out and navigate the world, kind of how to create those barriers and shields in their auras, but especially for those who are healers and who might be struggling with deep sensitivity or empathic abilities when they're serving others. Amazing. Brilliant advice. Thank you. This is a very, very common challenge that people face. And you shared some really valuable practices. I, while you were speaking about the zip up technique, though, I don't know the full details of the technique. I just, I tried it energetically and it, yeah. and it was really something. I, I actually felt a little too closed off. I'm trying to be open here and, and receptive. So I actually unzipped a little bit, but I felt, <laughs> I felt the effects of that practice. That's a really good, good idea and approach. And boundaries are so, so important. It's it's interesting, you know, many people that I encounter who I go through this big awakening, what I've found is that we learn how to, you know, become equanimous and therefore ourselves through this experience, through the pain that we have so we can release it for ourselves. And that ability doesn't get, you know, obsolete once we, you know, do a lot of healing work on ourselves. It seems that now it's like, bring on stuff from others too. And we just do the same work with it, just allowing it to come in and release. But but like you said, boundaries are important. We don't have to always, you know, play the role of, you know, bodhisattva or or be super open. There's an interesting story about a great Indian saint, Sri Ramana Maharshi. And he had like, you know, great following and, and did some really amazing work. And very, very open, of course. He became really sick. And his followers were getting afraid and worried, you know, he's going to, he's going to die. He's going to leave us. So they all said, you know, Ramana, give us all a little bit of your pain. Like give, we can take it on for you just to, so you can heal and stick around with us. And he says, where do you think I got all this pain from? I got it from you. Right. So uh, it's yeah. an interesting thing. You know, I think his thing was he would go into deep meditation and sort of process it. And that was yeah. his work to sort of maintain a, a, you know, the ability to keep doing the work. I think at a certain point, I, maybe I'm wrong, but he, he stopped doing the, the meditation with it for, for whatever reason. But okay, so th this is great, great advice that you shared. I, I think it's going to really speak to people. Another thing I'm curious about is, so around this, you mentioned boundaries, internal boundaries, boundaries between energy, and, and I'm sure within the dynamics of the people you're relating with. How about self-care to manage these sensitivities? Was there any things you had to change in your lifestyle to better adapt to this, this new phase of your journey? Absolutely. I think when this also started happening, there was a lot of physical health problems coming out. And so that needed to be managed through surgery and herbal, su herbal supplementation to create better balance within my body. And so with the whole Kundalini process, I really saw it as like, a mind, body, and spirit healing. So I would tap in and say, what does my body need right now? And at that time, um, I was, I had been vegetarian and vegan and vegetarian for several years. And then I went vegan and that was like not working for me anymore. I had incredible deficiencies and nutrients and things like that. And so it kind of conflicted with my spiritual beliefs of like, do no harm and compassion. But in that space, I needed to consume meat and it helped me feel more balanced and more well. And so I got to work on learning how to like, I can still have compassion and I can still have great revere, you know, for this life force. And so I really started to understand the power of blessing my food and really recognizing that when we bless our food and we give that things, it infuses that with the love and gratitude and, and our beliefs, so like in the Lakota culture, it's believed that then the spirit of that animal and that energy is then in turn, it receives that energy and that, that aids it in its own evolution. When it's loved and returned for its offering, it creates a balance. When it's just taken and it's over-consumed and it's not um, really appreciated and it's taken for granted, that's when it leaves waste. That's when we're consuming more than we're giving. And so I really started to understand this element of like blessing my food and so I started to do things too, like I would immerse myself in water. I dealt with a lot of fatigue and a lot of physical tension, and I was still working on balancing out some physical health problems that 
I really do feel we're expressing as a result of the spiritual and Kundalini awakening, but I would immerse myself in water and it would just give me these moments of just lightness. Like I didn't have to feel the exhaustion. I didn't have to feel the fatigue. I got to just float. And I just felt like I was held by, I don't know, like a spiritual grace that just gave me some alleviation from all of the, all of the discomfort and the heaviness. And then in that too, I would spend a lot of time out in nature. Um, I would go out and I, there was this community garden that we have and I would walk through this garden and I would just be in this place. It was just like, it was bringing me so much stillness and just a lot of peace. Um, and that really helped my mind and body start to recharge and feel more grounded as I was doing this. For the mental element of it, I, you know, with the self-care piece, I was doing a lot of self-examination of really understanding why do I believe the way that I do? Why do I act the way that I do? What are some behaviors that I really need to maybe work on improving within my relationships or the way that I treat and respond to myself? And then I um, continued to stay in therapy where I was doing EMDR work, a lot of inner child and inner compassion work. The Kundalini and the spiritual awakening brought out a lot of childhood trauma that I didn't really even recognize and associate with as a part of my history that I had to work on. And so a big part of this piece of the self-care piece that kind of goes away from the spiritual back into the psychological is recognizing dynamics of codependency. And so I started to go to CODA meetings. So it's codependency anonymous and really understanding how this dynamic really impacts our emotional, mental, and spiritual balance, you know, where we seek our validation, our worth outside of ourselves, or we might try to control environments or situations. So we feel like we're we have more of a sense of safety. And so as I started to do that and started to understand more of that psychological piece for my mind, that's how I supported like my mental health. And then for my spiritual health, self-care practices, it was working with healers, continuing to read books. I really loved um, Eckhart Tolle's teachings. And then I loved Dr. Hawkins, David Hawkins. And I really liked this because he had the psychiatry and the psychology background. So he fused this so beautifully with the like spiritual elements and he had some really big spiritual moments and awakening and he just married these two concepts in a way that my mind could really understand this and then the spiritual piece of practicing was the gratitude using the prayer and then using practices of um, meditation but another form of self-care was eventually getting into energy work and understanding how to muscle test how to change subconscious beliefs and how to use affirmations to um, create a better sense of balance to make sense of what I was going through while I was learning how to have better interpersonal boundaries, psychic boundaries, emotional, spiritual, and internal boundaries. And so for me, a big part of my spiritual lesson has been around boundaries, self-love, self-acceptance, and kind of working through doubt. You know, if I know that these are, these moments have given me so much amazing experience and insight and understanding, but there are these other moments where it's like, it's not tangible. And so I'm always looking for proof of like, I need to prove that I'm not crazy or that this is happening or that this is something I can really trust and rely on. And it took quite some time to get to that point where I can just really build that faith that like every challenging situation is only a catalyst and it's only really here for a deeper lesson of healing and self-growth. So. Fantastic. Thank you. That's a great, a great list of some very practical things that people can do uh, to help them get through, you know, very similar, similar challenges. So you, you mentioned going through some difficulty, some things from the past were coming up, childhood things, which is, of course, very, very common with the, you know, I, I call it the purification process that comes with, with Kundalini awakening. And, and you've mentioned your Lakota background. Can you speak a little bit about, you know, what those teachings and, and views meant for you and how you use them? And, and can you share with our audience so that maybe they can take a, a little bit of those, that wisdom and apply it in their own lives? The reason I'm asking is because, you know, we've explored it in this work, you know, we come across the typical stuff of yoga, of Buddhism, but not so much from the, you know, the indigenous uh, cultures in North America. So, so can you share a little bit about the Lakota wisdom? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of trauma and things like that was coming up and this feeling of like, 
you know, they, I was reading books too, and they were saying like, we get to choose our soul families. We choose our parents. We um, choose even the way that we look with the time frames that we're born. We have all this choice. And there was this mo- notion of like, I can't understand that. Like that doesn't quite make sense to me. But in the Lakota culture, we have this understanding too, that like, we're all interconnected. We're all one and everything is out of love. So even if it's a hardship or a challenge, it is love. It's the great mystery manifest in the physical world. So I was at this retreat and I was processing through a really painful relationship dynamic and this trauma. And all of a sudden I was, I got pulled into this vision and like these spirit guides or ancestors were around me and I couldn't see what they looked like. They were just like beings of white light. They had no like qualities or characteristics, um, like physical characteristics that really stood out. And they say, you keep thinking that the situation is about hate, that this person hates you or doesn't love you, but you don't realize that you needed to learn certain lessons. And you, if they needed to be the monster and play that role in your life for you to learn how to love yourself and for you to learn how to have unconditional love and acceptance for others and forgiveness, then they were willing to play that role for you in this life. And it wasn't out of their hatred for you. It was actually because they loved you so much that spirit to spirit, they said, I will be this role for you. I will play this for you and you will play this for me and we will help each other learn. And in that moment, it was really profound. There was so much forgiveness and so much acceptance. And in this particular relationship, we hadn't spoken for a few years because the dynamics were so toxic, but I just felt incredible peace and balance with them. And when I had actually returned home, I had gotten a call from them and they said something happened. And I just feel like there has been a shift between us. And can we, can we meet, like, can we explore the dynamic of our relationship and see if we can get back on track? And it was just like so much healing and karma had been resolved in that moment. Um, And after that, I really understood the the notion of spirit guides. And so I know that's talked about in many different um, cultures But we also talk about spirit guides in our Lakota culture and that we can call on these um, qualities of God or these actual like spiritual beings, whether it's an animal, whether it's um, an ancestor or our higher self. And so that's what really helped pull me back into like recognizing I can call for these things and I can ask for assistance. And each time that I did and I prayed for it, I would get the answer of like, can you please help me see why this situation is happening the way it is and then soon after I would get like this notion of message and be able to see things from a much clearer standpoint but also another dynamic too is that sometimes when our field is of a lower vibrational frequency it can kind of open our aura up to attachments and so whether that's spiritual attachments it's negative thoughts it's negative emotions or it's courtings or perhaps even curses and ill will from others or even towards ourselves I really started to understand like the practices of smudging in our culture. Sage is used to like smudge the area and you light it and you bring about this smoke. So it's like you're turning the physical dense um, energy of this plant life and through the fire, it is transmuting it into a metaphysical energy that then can clear out the space of any lower vibrational frequencies. So when I was going through so much trauma work and trauma and also being in a space of you know, experiencing this with clients and helping them process through that. I I had experiences of more like spirit attachments and clients had also discussed that too. And so one of the beliefs is that when you consume alcohol and drugs and things like that, it weakens your aura and you're more likely to pick up um, spirits that kind of feed off of your energy. And so sometimes they come because they can relate to depression or anxiety. And so they're attaching that or other times if you have an addiction, they're attaching to kind of get the pleasures of the flesh through you, you know, vicariously. So I really started to understand the use of medicine bags. And so we would get these medicine bags. And when I was a child um, and I'd be given one, I was like, why do I need this piece of bark? I don't understand what this, you know, the stone is or what all these different, you know, earth elements are. But later I understood that it's not really medicine, you know, that we see for the mind and the physical body, it's spiritual medicine. It's got, it has metaphysical qualities. So I started to use, you know, sage and started to use sweet grass then to invite in positive energy and positive spirit guides. 
but the really the basis of the Lakota culture too that I didn't understand so much as a child was its reference as animism. So it's belief that all life and all creation is the great mystery or the great spirit and that we're in the world of form and this is how the divine has manifested itself into this world. And so when you walk up to a tree, you're never supposed to just, you know, take what you want. You acknowledge the spirit within that earth element and you ask for permission. Like, may I have, may, before I take this, may I harvest this? May I have this of you? Would you be willing to align with my spiritual qualities, my purpose and intent and bring the same qualities that you resonate to help me with the spiritual purpose to serve the highest good for all or to spear, to serve like we call it Wakantanka. So that's the great spirit or the great mystery. And there's also terms like all my relations. So there's different terms of understanding that practicing everything as God. And I, I use God because I was also raised Catholic. And so I, instead of the great spirit or the great mystery, I use things like creator or God. And so it was really about learning how to see even a rock as a manifested form of creation, understanding how earth, air, fire, all of that are manifested forms and they are consciousness. They are spirit. There's life form energy in them. And when we use it to align with the right intentions and we're aligned, we can bring that into our field and kind of amplify what it is that we're asking for those qualities to help us with, whether it's healing, protection, cleansing, clearing, creating greater communication and clarity with um, the spirit world. And so once I started to understand that too, I could start to see things and remember that all is one. And so I started practicing seeing when I was looking at water, like this is a form of God. When I see another person, this is a manifestation of God. The harder part was seeing myself as God. I, there was still such a sense of separation. How I, there was like this part that was like, I'm too low. I'm too, you know, I'm not at that level of worth to be seen as, as part of the creator. So I think for me, it was really learning how to build that confidence in a humble way to not be like, oh, you know, I'm the next savior or incarnate of, you know, a spiritual guide or anything, but it was like, no, like I can have humility with worth and confidence and learning to see all life, including myself as one that really helped me start to integrate my spiritual practices. That was so reinforced when I read the law of one, where they were really just preaching the same thing that this, this is all one life form. We have just different perspectives and different stages of development, but we also have rituals and things like powwows where we use drumming and dance and chanting to kind of move out stagnant energy, but also bring in spiritual energy and create this positive tension through these ceremonies to connect and communicate deeper with spirit um, as well as things like a sweat lodge where you go into this dome shaped um, structure and very hot stones, the stones get um, put on fire and are in the center of a fire, you know, at the break of dawn. And then you move in there and they pour water on it and it creates this intense amount of steam. But through that steam and while you're in a facet state, it creates so much physical, intense feelings within the body. But it, that intention brings you so present within the moment. So then you're able to use that to gain greater access to going beyond the mind and body, and then being able to perceive more through spirit. And in that people have visions, they receive messages from spirit guides, or they receive messages they feel that are from the creator. And then they will bring that information back for themselves, their families, or their communities. And so once I had these awakening moments and started the learning of this, I really started to understand all these Lakota practices and traditions that I had been exposed to, I, I could fully feel the meaning behind, besides just it being like some cool outsider just saying, oh, let me watch these interesting dances or hear this music. But then after you experience that and you understand what it's all for, like it's so visceral and you can feel it and you can actually embody feeling the sense of spirit and oneness through these different acts and practices. Incredible. That's that's a really great sharing about the wisdom of the uh, Lakota culture. Uh, a lot of fresh things uh, to contemplate there. But once again, we see, and and part of my work here, my aim is to demonstrate. <clears throat> excuse me, is to demonstrate that this is a universal human phenomenon of spiritual awakening, spiritual healing, and transformation. Mm -hmm. 
that goes by many different names. Of course, Kundalini's famous name from from the uh, from India, but it's not the only paradigm that we can look at the process through. And so now we have another, or I have another way of looking through it and some more interesting modalities and, and concepts to, to, to look at this incredible process. I really love the way that, you know, it's described as the great mystery as life, mm-hmm. as existence, as the great mystery. I think that this speaks to, at least to me, the Kundalini process itself. A lot of people, myself included, being so intellectually oriented, want to try and understand exactly what this process is about. All the details, give me every little detail, what's going to happen next, when, how, what can I do to stop it? What can I do to make it better? I There's an element of mystery to it. There's an element Definitely. of mystery to this process that we have to surrender to and just, just let it unfold. So that's a lot of, of really great value that you shared there. So throughout your telling so far, you've shared some some difficult things, which I guess maybe you would say was part of your dark night of the soul. Mm-hmm. But I, I know you've spoken a little bit more about dark night of the soul in your other talks. So can you talk a little bit about what's the dark night of the soul? What or are the dark nights of the soul? What were they like for you? What can you say to those who can, you know, recognize that they're probably in a dark night right now? Do you have any anything to share with those people? Yeah. So the dark night of the soul, my first one was what led up to the spiritual awakening that happened eight years ago. And that was for, for me, I don't know what that will be like for everyone, because some people will have a big spiritual experience and then they'll experience the dark night afterwards. It's almost like when you raise your energy up to that level of vibrational frequency and you have all this spiritual clarity, your body says, okay, well, now we just got raised, this kundalini energy got raised into maybe the throat chakra, the heart, third eye or the crown, but your nervous system isn't adapted for that just yet. So in order to purify that for that, to live more within that state, all of the things that block that state have to first be recognized and processed through. And so my dark night of the soul happened kind of before and then continued to happen, you know, afterwards as I was processing, but I it was led through trauma. And the really big thing that really sticks out for me of the dark night of the soul is where we really lose the insight or any feeling that we are connected to the whole. We feel very isolated, very separate. We might lose understanding that this is a spiritual lesson and that this is all for something greater versus we feel like all I can focus on and feel is the suffering and a sense of being outside of the whole or the grace of God. And so some parts of this dark night of the soul too was incredible apathy and just feeling like nihilism and numb of like, what is the point of all of this? What's going on? But then there were deep moments of grief of like, why was I brought up to this super high spiritual state and these moments of just satori or samadhi in this blissed out place. And now I am back into the human experience that feels like concrete. It's heavy and it's dense. And I feel like I'm stuck within matter and I can't. I have these spiritual understandings, but I don't feel it. I'm not living in it. Um, And that sense of place could also be really um, kind of a disorienting process of like, why did I fall from the gates of heaven? You know, how do I get back to God? And you have a sense of like a grieving and missing God. Like I so badly want to be in union, but I think even in that process, it creates a credible devotion. So that fire and that yearning and that grief that we want with our higher selves or God or our center, it is creating the fire for the faith, for the trust to, you know, persevere down this path, but also creating so much energy um, to propel us to the path of devotion and um, doing this work. So we want to go in and self do self-examination and trauma work, which is very painful. But one of the cool things about the dark of the soul is that it does give you this ammunition to want to go towards the pain rather than go away from it and try to avoid it, minimize it and deny that this is a part of the experience. So the dark nights of the soul, oftentimes were associated with like grief, loss, trauma, feelings of being separate, feelings of like even low self-esteem, low self-worth are enduring, you know, whether it's a heartbreak or actually the physical death of someone or the loss of, you know, a physical ability or health um, circumstance or something going on with the job, these different moments can make us feel so low. And so in that place um, of being in a dark of the soul, I think 
practicing and also taking time away from spirituality and just saying, okay, how do I lean into my supports? Like I need to feel grounded and how do I find the people that love me? They're going to hold my hand and help me feel that way. And so I think through the darkness of the soul, like bond with others and connect with others, even though it can feel isolating that people don't really know where you're coming from. Um, but being around animals is a really incredible thing too, to kind of cultivate and get that, that good oxytocin released from the heart that gives us that sense of feeling of love and being connected. Um, and so doing things too, through like positive touch, but a big thing that really helped was I practice the mantra. I surrender my will for the will of God. And I don't understand this and I want to fight it and I want to resist it. And I want to do everything I can to get out of this dark of the soul. And I don't know if I'm being punished. I don't know if this is a lack of something that I did or didn't do that has me in this state. Cause those are just distortions of the ego. The ego feels it's so separate. And so I would recognize that this is just an illusion. This is just a temporary experience. And so affirmations really helped that this is not my true reality. I got a glimpse of what the true reality was. But in this place, I need to bring compassion and love into my life through other people, through myself. And I need to constantly feed and remind myself that I surrender to the will of God. And God doesn't want me to suffer. God isn't punishing me. My karma isn't to sit there and even out the score. This is really to teach me and that this is happening to me for a reason. And, and it's happening for me, not to me. And I really had to remember that in those dark nights of the soul where I felt so separate, where I felt like, oh, my world is coming down and it's being annihilated and ripped apart. And I remember my, myself, this is a part of releasing attachments. I sought to know God and I seek for God and I seek for the truth. And this is the part removing everything that is false and everything that I over identified with that blocks me from being able to live in that more recognized space of being in union with all of life, including the one infinite creator. And so that's kind of my perception, but it's hard. It's so hard. And so getting support and whether it's from a therapist or a friend and using affirmations and listening to really uplifting music, I like rap music and that has a certain vibrational frequency. I understand that. And so going through the dark nights of the soul too, I just really, as much as I can, I try to be very intentional about curating the type of energy I allow in my life. So I'm like, okay, no rap music, no violence, you know, in my media, I need to really listen to high vibrational frequency. I need to listen to, you know, stories and teachings of other spiritual teachers. So I can bring in that high vibrational energy to help my mind balance and keep remembering this is only temporary. This is just an illusion. And the truth is love. And I know that I've got to feel it, sense it, taste it, be with it. And that gives those little anchors of hope that help you get through any kind of dark passage. But then I always remember this is a rite of passage. This is a form of initiation. And something within me knows that I have the capacity to endure this. And I have to have the confidence in myself instead of feeling like I don't have the resilience and the strength to persevere and endure this. Wow. What a great message. Very well said. And I know that people out there listening, excuse me, I've got a bit of a scratchy throat today. <clears throat> I know that people out there listening are going to really resonate with that, with, with what you shared there. It's not happening to you. It's happening for you. And it won't be forever. And on the other side, well, there's there's healing. There's there's a new way of being, and it's from that place. You know, having after having gone through your own dark nights, now you're here. You know, it seems like you've come back around to share from a new place to share in in the way that you you've been sharing with us today. So, talk to us a little bit about the direction you've been called, you know, what sparked you to begin, you know, your, your YouTube channel and, and where do you see all of this kind of going? Not so much a prediction of the future, but where are you, where are you moving towards? Absolutely. So getting to work in mental health and being so rooted and grounded in kind of that form of healing has been such a blessing. I got to learn so much, but I started to realize there is we miss something when we don't include the spirit. 
And that happen, that shows up in any area, whether it's business, whether it's healing, whatnot. When spirit is not included, there is some type of a lack. There's some type of a disconnection there that we get restless and we start to seek for that sense of happiness or wholeness in a wide range of things, whether it's a new car or a job or anything like that. So I started to realize when, when it is included in the discussion, the outcomes for people's mental health and their overall well-being started to improve. Didn't mean that things were perfect. It didn't mean that we don't still get faced with challenges, but it's also cultivating an understanding of what is each person's own experience of spirituality. And so working in the field of mental health, we are confined by the limitations of the clinical model. There is so many beautiful things and I love, you know, all the therapy modalities, but there's a dynamic where the terms of kundalini or the chakras or meridians or the life force energy, or what do we do with blockages and changing those type of, you know, subconscious beliefs. That's where I started to feel that limitation of like, I can't work within this model and I need to move outside of it to include more of the spiritual practice so we can understand the power of our intentions and the power that we hold within ourselves that goes beyond just the mental health framework of beliefs, changing behavior, gaining education, because you can have all of the wisdom in the world and it doesn't make a difference sometimes because what we need is the love first, like the love and the connection to make that spiritual information even resonate and do any type of like, have any type of positive impact in our life. And so where I want to go with this is getting to work with others and learning so many about so much about like people's spiritual journeys is how do we support mental health, support the body, but then also how do we integrate conversations around the chakras, meditation, connecting with your spirit guides, you know, releasing curses or old energy or spiritual attachments like entities and things like that. And so through this work, so many notes were taken on how this can look. And so I want to just compile all of this information and say, you know, this is how we can build a deeper connection with our inner child and, you know, cultivate that compassion. And this is how we can cultivate forgiveness within relationships towards ourselves and others, or even towards God. Sometimes tragic things happen and we can build up this feeling of like, why would this happen? Why would God allow this to happen? And so sometimes we need to even resolve um, circumstances with that. So I hope to just compile all of this information to share with others how to support their emotional, mental, and physical well-being while also considering their spiritual health if that um, resonates for them and is in alignment with where their path is going and how do we do energy work. When I've been in meditations and I've understand energy work and releasing imbalances or energy elements, I just see these visions and images of like, it's kind of energetic debris and clutter that's like floating around in our fields or in our auras. And so through this, there's just been some information on how to clear that so we can have more balanced flowing um, energy, whether it's the Kundalini energy helping it, you know, release blockages and being able to move upwards on its journey or just releasing and improving physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual angst or discomfort and pain. So my hope is to share that information for anyone with kind of also understanding the dynamics of muscle testing as well. So it's taken a while for us to integrate mental health even into our physical general practices and healthcare model. So I think this is an exciting time. You know, we still have more integration to do between mental health and physical health. But I think this is kind of a cool way of like so many people like yourself too, kind of bridging and having these conversations to bridge. How do we safely include spirituality in the discussion and in the topic while still respecting these other frameworks, but also making this a part of a conversation so we can understand that trauma doesn't just happen like it's here to teach us that these catalysts and life lessons are opportunities for growth and not just feeling that we are victims to fates that we can't control rather than feeling like perhaps part of the experience I'm having I have a choice in this and I asked to learn this I forgot but I asked to learn what it felt like would be like to you know have problems with a certain health situation or finances or relationships or to experience grief or loss or sudden change. And so when we start to recognize this, that I think that really helps start to reframe that life just isn't happening. Like we have, there's more to faith than all of this. And it's for 
divine order and divine timing and potentiating, potentiating our spirits to fully integrate with our mind and body so we can live as more whole beings rather than these compartmented, compartmentalized and fragmented parts of knowing ourselves as um, rather than understanding we can accept and integrate all of them and one doesn't take more importance over the other. And that's my hopes of just for anyone who's looking for mind, body, spirit integration and learning how to touch base with their own intuitive healing abilities and just living very intentional lives. That's, that is my hope and my direction for my YouTube channel and kind of where I see my healing work with others going. Amazing. Very powerful, very inspiring. You're definitely moving, you know, at, at lightning speed in that direction. Like I said, your channel has got some great material on it. I invite everybody to go over and support Brittany in her work, check out her videos, follow along. Where else can people connect with you if they'd like to find out more about your work? Yeah. So right now my focus is mainly on YouTube, but I do have a website and I have blog posts and I share different poetry and writings and self-reflections on there. And that's brittmarie.com. And then I haven't built up my, I'm learning how to make all this content and it takes a lot of time, but eventually over time, I want to build up and make more short form pieces of content of just giving little tidbits of information on TikTok and Instagram. And there you can find me at Brittany underscore Marie 027. Great. And all the links for that will be in the description for you to connect with Brittany on uh, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, the internet. If, if people have uh, any questions about your journey, are, are you, uh, is there a way that they can contact you by email? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to my website again, it's brittmarie.com. And I have a connect page that you can go on there and send me an email um, or my email is info at brittmarie.com. And I'm always happy to just connect with others and if you have any support. I know that a big thing that really helped me was being able to reach out to like authors and teachers that had their own platforms and they held space for me and allowed me to share what was going on and really offered a guide. And so I appreciate that. And if I have the ability to pay that forward, I would be um, happy to do that. Amazing. Well, Brittany, thank you so much for sharing so openly you have a, a gift to really enter the flow and to speak. And a lot of, of gems were, were shared with the audience today and myself. So I really appreciate it. I'm going to have to listen back and process some more of what you shared because there was a lot, a lot of value. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing so openly, for sharing your wisdom, for doing the work for yourself, for others. It really means a whole lot. And to our audience out there, thank you all for spending some time with us today. Please go ahead and check out the description. You can connect with Brittany Marie. Thank you all for your support for this work and uh, the podcast, the channel. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. And until next time, much love and peace.